the second speaker today is Dr. Alex Yu. And uh, Dr. Yu uh, was graduated uh, in the University of Hong Kong in 1982 and uh, received nephrology training in Loyola University of Chicago. In 1991, uh, he was the assistant professor of medicine in Loyola University of Chicago. In 1995, uh, he came back to Hong Kong and became the associate professor of medicine in Chinese University of Hong Kong. And in 1998, uh, he was the chief of uh, renal unit in uh, Alice Hong Munich, Nata so Hospital. And uh, in 2003, uh, he was the chief of service in the Department of Medicine in uh, uh, Alice Hong Munich, Nata so Hospital. And currently, uh, Dr. Yu is the director of medical affairs in the Hong Kong Baptist Hospital. And during his time in the hospital authority, Dr. Alex Yu held a lot of uh, important positions in various committees such as uh, Central Window Committee and Medication Safety Committee. Uh, he also obtained the HA uh, Outstanding Staff and Team Award in 2008. Uh, besides, Dr. Yu also had a lot of uh, academic achievements. Uh, he received the Doctor of Medicine uh, in Hong Kong U in 2006. And Doctor Yu was also invited to give uh, lectures in many international and local nephrology conferences. He also published nine book chapters in nephrology fields and more than 80 uh, full-length articles and more than 100 abstracts in peer-reviewed international and local journals. And the topic uh, Dr. Yu gave us today is the acute TB injury, what is new. So, thank you, Dr. Yu. Thank you, Dr. Yu, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to also thank you know, Dr. Ho for inviting me to give this very important lecture. He gave me a very easy lecture, acute kidney injury. However, he gave me a, another difficult job saying that was new. You know, from my experience, you know, I have a question myself, okay? And then, uh, in, according to the Bible, Chun Dou Xu, they say, that Gong Zi Ha in Mo San Si, there's nothing new in the world. No? <laughs> so it's a very difficult topic you know, for me to, uh, uh, to give, but I will try my best. Okay. I try to give. Uh. Okay, so the first question I'll ask, you know, is, uh, Is this acute kidney injury a term new to you? If you say yes, then I answer part of it. I, I've done part of my job, you know, in introducing something new to you, you know, and uh, kept, have some you know, answer you know, to Dr. Ho already, you know, according to uh, his uh, uh, invitation. Okay. Uh, but what is it? Acute kidney injury. Anybody know what is acute kidney injury? So I presume it's new to somebody and not new to Dr. Ho at all. So uh, we've been talking about acute renal failure. And now with the new term right here, acute kidney injury, what's the difference between the two? Anybody can say? It's just a term, right? Okay, and I try to look for what does it mean by failure. Acute renal failure or renal failure have been used you know, by nephrology for a long, long time. You know? At that time, I don't even think about what does failure mean. So this time, when Dr. Ho gave me a job and I say, acute kidney injury, and then I've tried to overflow what we have been using long time ago, renal failure. So how can I overflow this term and throw it away? So I look up dictionary.com, what does failure mean, okay? So failure means the fact of not reaching the required standard, an examination, test, a course, etc., and etc. But then, what is the passing mark when you say somebody's failed, okay? I believe all of you have some kids, children. They might have grown up already. When they are uh, uh, taking education in high school, in university, okay? You, what, what do you teach the uh, kid? No, you, say, you have to achieve, achieve 100 points, or score 100 in every subject. When you fail to attain 100 marks, then you say you fail, okay? So, is, the, is it a failure for uh, a mark below 100? But actually, in our school you know, achievement, we say we fail a course only when our score is less than 50. 
Okay, but in your heart, this is anything less than 100 is failure for a children's achievement in school. Okay, so actually, there's a quite good synergy, you know, uh, between the kid and also the uh, uh, doing examination in school because the kid, as you know, the GFR is 100, right? The average is 100 mil per minute, and if it be no 100 per minute, it may be a failure. But actually, for acute renal failure, uh, for renal failure is something that is below 65 or 60 or mil per minute. It's a failure already. You don't have to be below 50 in order to fail. Okay. All right. Uh, so what's the problem with the term of acute renal failure that we have to uh, design to take on a new term? Uh, we know that uh, acute renal failure have been uh, quite common you know, uh, in the hospital setting, and it's usually associated with poor outcome. And most of the uncomplicated acute renal failure has been managed outside the ICU. They have a better prognosis. Mortality rate is about 5-10%. But for acute renal failure associated with other organ failure in, in, uh, in an intensive care unit, carries a higher mortality rate. It could be more than 50 to 100%. Uh, this is something against you know, uh, myocardial infarction. What does it mean? Because acute renal failure has been in the uh, nephrology field for a long, long time. And that mortality rate haven't improved that much, especially in the ICU setting. But look at those patients who have suffered from acute myocardial infarctions. Now, you know the development of angioplasty in the, field, uh, in the past, and then they put on stand, okay? And they can uh, classify those uh, patients that can benefit from it and those patients that cannot benefit from it. That means, and you also, for those who have training or some, uh, 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 some knowledge about the uh, different type of myocardial infarction, you also know that there's a ST elevated MI and also non ST elevated MI. The treatment is totally different. Okay, how do you know that treatment is totally different? Because you can classify them into different type of diseases or different type of myocardial infarction. So that during the study, they can tell which type uh, spectrum of that myocardial infarction benefit from a certain type of treatment or modality of treatment. Okay. But look at the acute renal failure. There are a lot of definitions associated with acute renal failure. You can see over here uh, that most uh, people uh, uh, quote the paper is in the first column, uh, actually in the first row. Uh, uh, the one done by Solomon, uh, Tepos, Ward, etc., etc. They were using a definition of acute renal failure as a 0.5 mg per deciliter increase in serum creatinine between 48 hours. But look at other paper. Okay? They say, you know, in how Susan Howe, she's from uh, uh, U of Chicago, which is close to my uh, uh, university medical school that I uh, worked before. And actually, later on, she uh, changed her position from U of Chicago to Loyola University as a professor as well. And uh, in her study, she said, you know, uh, Acute renal failure means 0.5 mg per deciliter increase in serum creatinine, but she was at a term if the baseline serum creatinine was 1.9 mg per deciliter. Or it says it, it increased by 1.5 mg per deciliter increase in serum creatinine if baseline is between 2 to 4.9. You have to, uh, I have to apologize that you know, we're using mg per deciliter because those are old studies. And you know, you know, most studies are, uh, are produced you know, in Europe and also in America. In Europe, they are using ASI system, but in America, those people are very stubborn. Okay, <laughs> so they are still using milligram per deciliter right now, even right now. Okay, so they might they are using milligram per deciliter, but uh, 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 the pro you just think about the proportion of no uh, increase. And it's been uh, and you can see all other studies about renal failure. They have different type of definition about acute acute renal failure. But actually, you know, serum creatinine does not, you know, accurately reflect GFR in patients who is not in a steady state. Uh, the patient might have a normal creatinine, but the GFR, you know, decreased significantly. And in the early stage of severe acute renal failure, the serum creatinine may be low, even though the actual uh, GFR is markedly reduced. And there's a lack of consensus, you know, in the quantitative definition of acute renal failure, and this hinder the clinical research in this area and improve our management of acute renal failure. So there's a group of nephrologists, and actually those are intensivists who take care of the da, uh, uh, renal patient in the, da, uh, in the ICU. Uh, they call it acute diagnosis called initiative group. They develop a system for diagnosis and classification of a broad spectrum of acute impairment kidney function for, uh, with a group of experts. 
and it proposed a rifle criteria with three levels of injury and two outcome measures. Uh, that is outlined over here. What they use is that uh, when a, a kidney suffers some damage or impairment, they uh, divide them into three grades, risk, injury, and failure, and two outcome, loss, the function, or end-stage disease. They use two different uh, categories to classify them, GFR criteria and urinal criteria. The kidney is suffering from the risk of loss of kidney function, and its increase in serum kidney was 1.5 times the baseline, or GFR decreased by more than 25%. Or when the urine output is less than 0.5 mL per kilogram per hour in six hours, that's about 200 mL in six hours. Or when they suffer from injury, okay, they have increased the urine by two times, GFR decreased by more than 50%, and the urine output in 12 hours less than uh, 400 mL. Or it's failure when the creatine increased by three times, GFR decreased by three quarter, and then the creatine may be more than four mg per 100 you know, acute rise of 0 0.5 mg per 100 mil per deciliter. The urine output in 24 hours is less than 500 mil or become anuria in uh, 12 hours. For those pe uh, patients who suffer from persistent acute renal failure, just uh, complete loss of renal function for more than four weeks, because as you know, some patients may need dialysis for four weeks before you can say the patient has some chronic you know, uh, or end-stage renal disease. So we dialyze them for four weeks, that we just tell, say that the patient has uh, a loss of renal function. That's why in America, you know, when a patient develops a new uh, 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 disease, new kidney disease, that they need to be dialyzed, uh, the patient, uh, they classify them as acute dialysis for three months before the government uh, pick up the reimbursement for their dialysis at the time when they go into chronic dialysis and they label them end stage renal disease. Later on, Yes, and a, a, a group of people who form an acute kidney injury network, and they start propose the term acute kidney injury. What they think because you know, acute kidney injury is better termed than acute renal failure because of clinical syndrome, the renal failure is clinical syndrome. It's a source of acute change in renal function, and it's a, a spectrum of acute renal failure. It includes both injury and impairment. Okay, there are some patients who have actual damage to the kidney without actual damage to the kidney, but with functional impairment relative to the physiological demand, say for some of those pre-renal renal failure. We also call this acute renal failure before. But actually, there's no function, uh, there's no, no uh, 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 structural damage, but the physiological uh, damage causing renal failure. And with early intervention, we reverse the impairment. Say for some in renal renal failure, once we give them the fluid, their renal function recover. Further on, the Cape uh, Dico, you know, group, that is a kidney disease improving global outcome group, who classified the chronic kidney disease into five stages. Now they start classify them, the acute kidney injury, to three stages. Okay? After they did a good job, because now they all over the world uh, 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 classify CKD in the five stages so that we can compare the outcome and the treatment method. For stage one DC, uh, ATI is 1.5 to 9.5 times the baseline creatine level, or using the urine up, uh, or the 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter. Now, you know, we convert this a little bit you know, to micromole so that we uh, can uh, compare differences. More than 26 micromole per liter increase in serum creatine, or the urine output is less than 0 0.5 mL per kilogram per hour. For six to 12 hours, it's from 200 mL to 400 mL. Stage two, two is the serum creatinine increased by 2 to 2.5 times, renal put less than 0 0.5 mil per kilogram per hour. Stage 3 is a more severe disease, baseline creatinine increased by 3 times, or you know, to more than 4 million per deciliter, or the urine output is less than 0 0.3 mil per 24 hours, 500 mil per day, or anuria for more than 12 hours, or when the patient requires renal replacement therapy already. Of course, in younger <coughs> patients, they use an uh, estimate GFR less than 35 mil per minute, 1.73 liters squared. So everybody knows about the etiology of AKI, so uh, that is the same as uh, acute renal failure before. I don't need to repeat that. But I want to emphasize that, you know, acute tuberculosis, necrosis, acute renal disease, or acute superimposed on chronic kidney disease mostly due to acute tuberculosis, necrosis account for about 80% of all those AKI. 
and for urinary tract infection, count for 10%, bone marrow arthritis or vasculitis for 4%, industrial arthritis 2%, and nephrolog embolus for 1%. I'm not going to touch on the management of all these, or the cause, or etiology of all these, you know, uh, 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 etiologies on ATI, ATI, because they might be covered by other lecture and speaker as well. What I need to, you know, I would like to update you, you know, is on the diagnostic approach to AKI. First of all, when a patient comes to our office with an impaired serum creatinine, how do we know this impaired serum creatinine is due to acute renal failure, acute kidney injury from a chronic kidney disease? Okay? But there's a definition, as I mentioned before, in CKD. When you measure GFR, it could be less than Six, uh, 60 mil per minute. All this evidence of kidney damage, such as albuminuria, uh, and normal findings on window imaging has been present for more than three months. So if the serum creatinine presents to you just with those tests, there's no way you can tell whether it's acute or chronic. You might need to find out some associated factors or uh, signs or symptoms before you can tell whether it's something acute or chronic. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, duration of disease is important. Chronic disease is when the GFR is impaired by more than three months. So if the patient has serum creatinine three months ago, six months ago, it helps us to decide whether it's acute or chronic. Or when the patient pre previous urine analysis, if the patient has albuminuria or, uh, uh, or hematuria you know, uh, three months ago, then it's not something acute. Okay. Signs and symptoms can also help us because most of acute, with acute uh, kidney injury uh, or impairment, kidney impairment, may present some symptoms like anasaka, generalized edema, or some discolored urine, which uh, point to hemorrhosis, okay, or hematuria. And the urine output may be decreased with prolonged oliguria or anuria. And then sometimes when we are consulted for patients stay in the hospital, we can see the daily symptoms rising as well to more than you know, uh, 20 to 40 uh, uh, micromole per liter per day in acute tumor process. Of course, finally, the way to decide whether it's acute or chronic is ultrasound kidney. Small kidneys are due most of the time uh, chronic, uh, as well as chronic illness. Okay? Uh, the small kidney means it's less than 7 to 8 cm, and there will be increased echogenicity in ultrasound as well. Anemia might help. Okay? In Anemia is not present at acute renal failure unless the patient has some coexisting illness uh, uh, or you know, the patient has some uh, uh, in acute renal failure due to uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or in kids we call hemolytic urine syndrome okay, or patient SLE. Nowadays, there are some biomarkers to help us to decide whether this is acute kidney injury or not. Okay. <laughs> So I have spent a little time about the AKI biomarkers. I'd like to emphasize that the biomarkers have been uh, uh, studied for quite some years already, for almost you know, uh, six to seven years. And most of them are investigational. And most of them that are being named you know, or being uh, studied in the uh, literature is the NGEL, what we call neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. There are some other biomarkers as well. They call kidney injury molecule number one, interleukin 18 or cystatin C. What they, do they come from? They come from the tubular cells of the kidney. They, when they are detected, they are when they are elevated, they usually elevated in the early stage of the tubular damage. And it's markedly increased after renal ischemia as well. So you can distinguish, distinguish renal AKI from ATM. They may have a prognostic value you know, as well. In this study, uh, for a group of patients who underwent when, you know, uh, cardiac surgeries, uh, they try to study urinary biomarkers and try to find out their clinical prognosis associated with them in patients who have an you know, acute kidney injury. The patient's uh, uh, urine uh, were checked for the biomarkers like NGEL and KIM1, also other biomarkers as well, after the patient have induction of anesthesia. This is the baseline. And then after the, right after the surgery, after closing, and then after patient transferred ICU, six hours in ICU, and day one. They found out that you know, those patients who have no AKI, the NGL level or the KIM level is on the low side. But when they have stage 
three uh, uh, AKI, you see the elevation of those uh, markets, uh, NGL and KIM1 as well. And those NGL is elevated you know, while they create uh, in another study, you know, studying the outcome of those uh, neutral field gelatinase associated lipocalin positive uh, subclinical kidney injury. There was another study, you know, studying, comparing the significance of NGL and also serum creatine. What they found out is that NGL can be elevated, although the serum creatine is not elevated at all, when the AKI is developed. You can see over here, in this group of patients, the NGL is positive, that means elevated. Serum creatine is not elevated, it's a, include about 400 patients. Some of them require dialysis. When the angel is negative and serum creatine is greatly elevated, some, most of them require dialysis as well. Maybe in this case, why the angel is negative? Maybe some of all those epithelial cells, you know, they, after the damage, all the enzyme was released and they need regeneration. Okay, that's why at this time, serum creatine starts elevated, the angel might be negative. And they found that if the angel and the serum creatine are both positive, then all of them did us, you know, most of them uh, did us, well. and also the in hospital mortality also has a stepwise increase uh, related to the uh, uh, biomarker and the uh, presence of the uh, serum creatine. As you can see over here, besides the mortality, you can see that uh, medium length of stay in ICU, there's also a stepwise increase in the length of stay in the ICU and also in the hospital according to stratification between the NGL and the serum creatine. However, okay, we all say, oh great, you know, just like myocardial infarction, uh, we have a chopping T, chopping I, something, those bar markers come out, when the patient comes with chest pain, we check those blood tests and then we can tell right away when the patient is suffering from myocardial infarction. We can use this during the bar markers to help us uh, to differentiate whether the patient has acute kidney injury or not, okay, because as I mentioned, 80% of them with acute kidney injury uh, due to ATA, okay? Uh, but it's not designed for this use because uh, used in the, they are used in the clinical investigation. Those biomarkers is to use in those investigations to, to be randomized into different treatment arms in the study, but not for clinical use at all. And actually in the United States, you know, they are not approved for clinical use yet. Why not? Because they need more validations in different clinical ATI conditions, and they need to develop rapid assay method. For those biomarkers, it takes some time. By the time you've had the result back, the patient has a uh, full-blown AKI, then you might need dialysis rate. There's no point you can predict. Unlike the chopping tea, which have a turnaround time of about half an hour to one hour, you know right away whether the patient go to cardiac nap for angioplasty and then uh, stenting uh, or not. Okay? And another problem is that we might not, uh, uh, one biomarker might not be enough to tell whether it's ATN or not. We might need a panel of biomarkers rather than a single market. Okay. How about management? Okay. It's easy because you're according to the etiologies, you manage the patient differently. And I mentioned those etiologies before, glomerulophytis, vasculitis, obstruction, then you treat them accordingly. I don't want to spend time on it because it will be another or two or three lectures. But I would like to talk about more about food overload and nutrition which has some update you know, in uh, the study over there. We all know that in chronic kidney disease, as mentioned before, you know, in the hemodialysis patient, with fluid overload, there are more cardiac problems, there are more heart failure, the mortality rates are higher. It's been well known already in chronic kidney disease on dialysis. Fluid overload increased mortality. But actually, it's also demonstrated that in daily uh, fluid balances, also quite important you know, in the uh, uh, outcome of the ATN or patient AKI uh, in the hospital or in the intensive care unit. Why fluid overload or fluid balance is a common problem in AKI? Because you know, most of the time, uh, the, case, the patient might suffer from shock and causing AKI. The first uh, uh, treatment uh, we are going to use is fluid resuscitation. I still remember that, you know, uh, uh, for those people who worked in Prince of Wales Hospital before, uh, I worked, when I first came back to Hong Kong, you know, I joined Chinese University of Hong Kong, and then uh, Prince of Wales Hospital is the teaching hospital of Chinese U. And uh, 
in my place, in all other places, no. ICU was being managed by who? Physician, right? Is there any anesthesiologist over here or surgeon over here? I'm glad that, that uh, there's no such people uh, over here. When I first came back, uh, we're being consulted to the ICU to dialyze the patient, and then we try to flip back why the patient needs dialysis. And we examine the patient, the patient is blown up already. Blown up, blown up means you know, the patient has a lot of fluid, the edema, on the, from the face, from the head, to the toe. And we ask the intensivist, this is a term I learned you know, in, in Hong Kong, I learned, never learned about intensives. We only have physician, intensive care physician you know, in uh, America. And then uh, we ask the intensivist, you know, why does the patient have so much fluid? And now you ask us to uh, 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 suck it out you know, in some uh, jargon. Okay? Imagine, oh, the patient has no urine output. We think the patient has hypovolemic, so we give him a lot of fluid. And then there's still no more urine output. We still give them more fluid so that we can squeeze or, or push the, you know, the kidney to uh, give out more urine. We know that uh, there's also a uh, different outcome or prognostic you know, uh, uh, factors associated with oliguria and non oliguria We know you know, uh, failure at the time, that's what we call. So they try to maintain their uh, urine output and they give a lot of fluid and then the patient blown up. Okay? And of course, you know, uh, later on, the patient get dialysis and they might die. Okay? Of course, those fluids are also administered due to the use of antibiotics and also other intravenous medication especially uh, the nutritional support, the hyperalimentation the patient is receiving in the critical care unit. Okay, as I mentioned before, we've demonstrated you know, uh, positive fluid balance or fluid overload. Uh, we, it's a source of worse outcome in those patients chronic renal failure on dialysis. And that study right now, uh, this study was done in 2008, to prove that you know, a positive fluid balance is a source of worse outcome in patients with acute renal failure. What they did is that they collect data or extract the data from the sepsis occurrence in acute ill patients, a study you know, that is uh, running in 198 uh, intensive care units in 24 you know, European countries. Uh, of that 3,000 patients including in this study, in this study about more than 1,000 of them have, uh, suffer from acute renal failure at some point during their intensive care state, ICU state. You will find that you know, the mortality rate in patients with acute, uh, with early and late acute renal failure were similar. As you can see over here, the survival rate is about the same. But those patients with low acute renal failure, uh, the survival rate is higher. In the COC regression analysis related to 60-day uh, mortality, fluid balance is one of the factors. And when the patient with early and late onset acute renal failure were analyzed separately, the mean fluid balance is an independent predictor of mortality in patient with early acute renal failure. So those intensives did, they did give a lot of fluid to the patient, so they die faster. Even though we went to the dialysis, uh, intensive care unit, dialysis them, they still die. Okay. And then the mean fluid balance was significantly more positive in patients with early and late uh, in, uh, acute renal failure as well, as you can see in this graph over here. And I think what I mentioned before is that you know, we want to convert a patient who has uh, oliguric renal impairment to a non oliguric renal impairment so that we can manage the patient better in terms of fluid and also metabolic you know, uh, uh, and the electrolytes as well. Because patients with uh, non oliguric renal failure, with oligric renal failure, they may have higher instance of metabolic acidosis and also hyperkalemia. In this study, you know, they compared the non oligric failure and also oligric acute kidney injury according to the uh, 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 rifle, uh, uh, rifle guide uh, criteria. You will find that you know, patients with oligric uh, acute kidney injury suffer more severe disease uh, than non oligric acute kidney disease. And then also, you know, those uh, patients who have oligric you know, uh, acute kidney disease require acute dialysis, long-term dialysis, and high fluid mortality than on oligarchic disease. So what's the usual practice that we did to uh, convert this patient from oligarchic renal acute injury to long oligarchic uh, 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 long oligarchic kidney injury? We usually use diuretics, right? We give them Lasix. However, in this study, it's a fluid balance, dietic use, and mortality in acute kidney injury. You'll find that you know, in this multi-center randomized control study, 
to try to evaluate the association of post renal injury fluid balance direct use with 60 day mortality in patients with direct AKI. They found that those group of patients actually is only uh, in the fluid, you know, restricted group, they have about one liter more fluid in intake per day compared to their restricted group. However, uh, those patients who survive use have a high percentage usage of the late uh, diuretics compared to the blunt survivor. 25% of those patients use the diuretics compared to the blunt survivor group of only 13%. So diuretic use in 24 hours, you know, lower the mortality. However, in the multiple, multiple logistic regression, we found that uh, the mean post AKI fluorosomized dose seems significantly associated with decreased mortality, but the association uh, was not significant after they adjust for the post AKI fluid balance. That means it seems diuretics, basics, help to decrease mortality but only up to a certain point. When they have too much fluid balance, uh, fluid overload, there's no uh, uh, effect at all. So the message is that do not use diuretics for prolonged therapy to postpone the initiation phase. So once you give the diuretics for quite some time, the patient is not responding and still getting more fluid, you should stop using, not stop, you know, but can continue, but you have to use some more, something else to help the patient as well, and that's dialysis. And in this patient, in this study, fluid accumulation, survival, and recovery of kidney function in critically ill patient acute kidney injury, that was uh, uh, done in 2009, what you found is that among dialysis patient survivors, uh, among the dialysis patient with acute kidney injury, survivors have significantly lower fluid accumulation, okay, compared to non survivor And the patients with fluid overload, when the seem getting rich is peak, were significantly less likely to recover kidney function. What it means is that those patients who die early has less fluid, and then even the kidney function may recover as well. Okay, so dialysis actually, you know, uh, is necessary in some of, uh, at some time uh, of the AKI stage to all the most efficient method of wrong overload removal in patients with AKI and our last condition to optimize the nutritional support and the use of intravenous medication because, as I mentioned before, most of those fruits are being gained by use of IV antibiotics and other nutrition as well. Okay, I mentioned I'll touch on nutrition because most of patients when they develop AKI, they still they are in the ICU and uh, we are concentrating ourselves in how to recover the kidney function, how to balance the fluid, and how to correct the electrolytes, we tend to uh, forget about the nutrition. So the patient might be starved for three to five days before we start the nutrition. However, you have been studied that you know, those patients need approximately 25 to 30 kilocal per kilogram a day. And, uh, 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 and also, those are uh, uh, critically ill patients require higher protein intake, you know, uh, than you know uh, the patient who doesn't need dialysis at all. So sometimes we say, well, the patient is critically ill, stay so the intubate. What should we do? You know, should we continue enteral feeding or should we start, you know, enteral nutrition? Is there any harm or benefit, you know, of one over the other? In this study talking about enteric nutrition patient acute you know, renal failure to uh, in 2004, it says enteric nutrition related complications uh, and adequacy of nutritional nutrient administration during 2,000 days of artificial nutrition in 247 consultation fed exclusively by enteric would and they were studied. You found out that, that those patients are uh, divided in three groups. Those patients who require dialysis, those have ATI but do not require dialysis, and 65 of them have normal renal function. Other than those increased incidence of basogastric tube obstruction, high gastric residual volume among dialysis, pa dialysis patients. It's very common for those patients who are on dialysis have high gastric residual volume. There's no difference in gastrointestinal and mechanical complication in three groups. The mean, uh, the mean amount of non protein and protein calories intake. It's about 23 and 0.9 gram per kilogram, uh, respectively. And it seems the total calories deliver, delivered by protein is slightly less than recommended, as we know that the protein intake should be around about 0.8 to 1.2 gram. It's only it's slightly, so it's less than one, okay? In this case, the patient might be, uh, uh, because of hypercatabolism, the patient might be uh, under uh, nutrition. 
So in this case, they recommend giving pyandro amino acid during daily dialysis. In a Cochrane review, in, that was published in 2012, and uh, they reviewed a lot of studies. They found it's only very few good studies that have evaluated the safety and efficacy of parental nutrition among patients with AKI. And they were unable to show overall benefit of parental nutrition survival, but limited by very poor quality of article studies. So we might, this might be a study area uh, uh, about the nutrition on AKI patient in an acute uh, critical care unit uh, that we need to know more about how to treat them or help them. Okay, I think the time is up. What I've uh, talked about today, I hope this is new to you, is to define the AKI, the staging, the diagnostic approach, and also introduce the biomarkers, the significance of fluid balance on patient outcome with AKI, and then limit, try to limit the prolonged use of diuretics, and consider use of dialysis therapy earlier. I say earlier, not mean early, because there's no study proven that you know, using dialysis early benefits, but we have to use our judicial clinical judgment that we should use dialysis therapy earlier once the uh, diuretics fail. And then I also mentioned about the nutri important nutritional support in the AKI patient. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yu. I'm sure that uh, all of us uh, learned a lot from Dr. Yu's uh, lecture about the AKI. So, any questions for Dr. Yu? Yes. Yeah, you. I It's quite accepted in uh, uh, global or universal you know, investigational study. And uh, it's quite commonly used in uh, America and Europe right now. Although it might take some time for us to you know, uh, get adapted to it. When I first use it, I also have the same feeling as you have. You know, inch is something different. But then it might take time for us to accept it because it, that's why there are more studies coming out using AKI so that they can compare different types of stage treatment modality and compare the prognostic value as well. So I totally agree with your uh, approach. But uh, this time not for us to correct our uh, uh, research. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
If there's no more question, I would like to thank Dr. Yu again.